And so, regardless of uh, where you come from, uh, welcome. And I hope that there's uh, a way that you can participate in this conversation and that you find some part of what we talk about today uh, that will apply to either your professional or your personal life. Um, and uh, I'm in process, certainly, in learning about these things. And um, but let me tell you a little bit about where I come from so you can contextualize a little bit what I'm saying. So I uh, got into the autism game right after my undergraduate degree when I started working for a psychologist doing neuropsych evaluations. I supported uh, you know, that process, uh, doing diagnostic evaluations for you know, children with autism and other, um, and other um, kind of behavioral disorders, ADHD and things like that. And then moved into doing behavioral interventions, had some consultation appointments with school districts uh, to uh, go into the classrooms and, and see if there were things we could do to make those environments uh, more conducive to learning for children with autism. Um, and then uh, moved into social skills groups for children and adults, young adults. Uh, that was a lot of fun, going to coffee shops and restaurants for the first time with some young adults um, with, uh, with Asperger's and, and watching them pay the bill for the first time and uh, sort of the pride they felt about that. It was wonderful to be a part of. Um, and then I had a school social work appointment for a year as part of an internship. And then after that, I moved into uh, child and family therapy. And I worked in an outpatient mental health setting. In my, in my specialty area I was working with children and young adults with autism spectrum disorder and their families. And so um, I feel very uh, privileged to have been able to know a lot of families um, who have individuals with autism spectrum disorder and their families, and um, I feel privileged to be able to talk about this today. And it's certainly, when I think about my research, it, it, there, um, maybe some of you have met me so far, when I talk about my research, I always end up doing a lot of storytelling. Because those stories and those families that I know are really what drive um, my research questions and the things that I care about, and, and kind of what I hope my work achieves you know, 20 years down the road. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Flip the page. Okay, so uh, let me start off by making what I think is probably going to be a pretty provocative statement in this room, and that is that um, families are important. Okay, no one's throwing rocks at me. Yeah, no one's throwing tomatoes. Of course not. Um, that's not a provocative statement, particularly here at Nice Auger Center, where you have services that really meet the needs of all sorts of family members all along the lifespan. I mean, this really is a wonderful place. And the more I read and the more people I meet, the more impressed I am about the work that you all do here. A wonderful asset to the community. Um, but even so, I think that uh, those of us who uh, are doing research in autism or are uh, professionals providing services to individuals with autism, I think we, uh, we, can, we can underestimate just how powerful family is. We can become service-centric. One way of thinking about it, that we... Uh, we start to see the world through the eyes of the services we can provide to people. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's like when you have a hammer, you start to see nails everywhere. And uh, none of us want to be that way or, you know, um, but I think that can happen over time to where we, uh, we can become really focused on, you know, just fine-tuning an evidence-based intervention through, you know, through clinical trials or through getting the, the most precise measurement instruments and, and maybe we sort of come to believe that that's what's going to help people in the end and that's what's going to have the biggest effect in people's lives. Um, and I think what may be more provocative, I don't know, maybe not, but is um, my, it's my conviction that um, those instruments and tools and interventions <coughs> are only as good as the, the sort of the support network and the system that they go out into the world in. And so um, even the most well-designed behavior plan can't, uh, 
can be um, sort of mid the outcomes of that can be minimized by a family that doesn't follow through with it or that disagrees about its implementation. Uh, the even if we get right to the right medication and the right dosage, we've titrated it out perfectly. That may also not achieve the right the outcomes we hope if parents don't follow through with the um, the administration of the medication, the um, you know other dietary things that they were supposed to watch out for when they were administering the medication. They can't get the child to sleep. You know, I mean, there are all sorts of things that um, that influence the uh, the uh, the power of our interventions, and I think we forget that. Um, now, please don't think I'm dismissing those interventions. All of the things I mentioned are absolutely critical. They're worth the money, they're worth our time. Um, but they're going to be made that much more powerful if they're delivered in a, in a manner that's consistent with the family context, with the beliefs, the attitudes, the patterns of that particular family. If we have, uh, for lack of a better term, buy-in from the family um, for our interventions. And I, of course, right now, I'm, I'm talking a little bit more about younger children. Uh, but the same holds true for throughout, uh, throughout, our, throughout life. OK, so with that in mind, I've got three hopes for our short time together today. The first is, I hope that we'll be able to articulate or have sort of a vision for the central role of family in the health and adjustment of individuals with ASD. Uh, that we'll be able to identify specific family factors that contribute to ASD outcomes um, and service delivery success. And that we'll be able to at least discuss a family-centered agenda for research, intervention, and support for families of children with ASD. Does that sound okay to you? because I don't have slides for the other things. <laughs> PowerPoint makes me go in a line. Okay. So before we get started, I'd like to uh, present a three-minute history of research related to families of individuals with ASD. Um, this uh, you know, could alternatively be tired, uh, this could be alternatively titled The Comedy of PowerPoint Errors. As you'll see in a minute. Okay. So um, here's uh, the beginning of our family here. Um, and in the beginning, there was the refrigerator mother. People familiar with that term? From this perspective, um, we believe that children developed autism as a result of their mother's lack of affection, lack of warmth, uh, maybe um, you know, sending mixed signals the causal arrow went from the mother to the child. Then we came to realize that even uh, very loving and affectionate mothers had children with autism. And that, uh, that kind of, we started to change the way we were thinking about that. Also, a range of social movements were happening that helped us to move past that phase. Um, I just can't imagine the pain that a mother would have experienced when she went to seek help and instead found blame and shame and judgment. I mean, it, it's hard to imagine on top of everything else what that would have been like. So happy we're not there anymore. Okay. Okay, then uh, the next line of autism research is uh, you know, best called sort of a crisis approach, or and sort of then became softened to a stress and coping approach, uh, where you know most of the questions that are asked, and this is true of my own research and a lot of papers that I read, published 2013, um, that are basically asking the question, how bad off are you of parents of, of families of children with ASD? So we only include measures of stress, depression, and then we look at some characteristics of the child, like um, autism severity, severity of symptoms, uh, you know, things like that. How stressed are you? The problem with that is that even if you're 
you're very low on stress, but still only means you're, you're sort of less negative than others. Um, and even the word coping sometimes implies that, you know, you're kind of making it, you're sort of, you're doing all right, you're coping, but it's driving, or, you know, feeling satisfied. Um, and also most of this research still is around mothers. And if, uh, you know, I could ask this group, we could probably get into a great discussion about why it is that uh, mothers are so much more responsive to research than fathers are. Um, but I won't go there today. <laughs> I guess in all kinds of places. Okay, uh, but more and more research is expanding out. You know, looking at siblings. There are a lot of studies now about siblings. Uh, more studies looking at fathers and trying really hard, over-recruiting, over-sampling for fathers try and understand that story a little better. Um, and, uh, and then we're back here. Um, I couldn't get smiley faces on my people, but imagine that smiley faces have just emerged <laughs> onto these people. Um, and w there have been a number of studies that have started to look at, you know, out of positive psychology, uh, looking at how, what are the positive benefits that you experience as a result of your family member with, an, with autism spectrum disorder. Parents often report deeper meaning, a sense of closeness and cohesion, um, a clarity of purpose in their lives, uh, joy through the little things, the little achievements, uh, you know, that it's sort of stripped away. Um, in one of my qualitative studies, there, I have a, there's a great quote that sticks in my mind where the mother's talking about this, how the this experience has sort of stripped away all the irrelevancies and clutter of life and really helped her to become uh, focused on the things that really matter. And that's much, she, she feels more deeply satisfied with her life now. Um, and so a number of studies have started looking at positive contributions. And then uh, less studies are looking at um, this two way. So these going back and forth from the child to the family members. This is a little bit more risky. Um, and I think partly it's because we have such good information about the genetic contributions to autism and the sort of physiological characteristics. And so it's easy for us to think about this as a kind of a biological or a sort of individual brain-based uh, condition that we we don't often think about how relationships might influence challenging behaviors. Um, I think that's part of it. I think it, another part of that is we're just a little bit fearful and a little bit uncomfortable. We're a little bit haunted by the refrigerator mother tradition. That's what I, I suspect, too. Is that it feels a little risky to ask about how family members may be contributing to either the growth or the in, increased challenging behavior. But we've got some, you know, uh, some good longitudinal studies that have come out recently, like Toxica and Hastings and some others, that have uh, have shown that parent adjustment at time one is predictive of child behavior problems at age five, you know, four years out, um, but not the other way around. The child behavior problems at at, uh, at point, the first time point were not predictive of parent adjustment later on, and so it's starting to give us a sense that they're but this is, um, there's at least a reciprocal relationship here. Which anybody that works with families knows that these relationships are never linear. As much as we'd like to make them that way in our studies, um, they're never linear. Um, and then the reality is more like this, when we start thinking about family and family research. But the whole notion of a system is that all of these parts are interrelated and affecting each other all the time. That conflict between these two siblings impacts this individual. Uh, disagreement between parents impacts the children. And we could draw arrows all over the place. We could draw a lot more arrows to really represent what we're talking about. And that's part of the challenge of really moving towards a more systematic, integra integrated approach to family research and family effects.
I'll talk more about that towards the end. But um, I'd like to propose just a few possible mechanisms through which family adjustment and, and sort of families in general can impact um, outcomes for individuals with ASD. The first is that, um, you know, we think about early identification and, and diagnosis. There's a lot of work being done here around training pediatricians. Uh, a lot of great work, and a lot of great work around early screening instruments and things like that. Um, and there are, but there's still this element of, from, on the parents' uh, side, of there needs to be a certain amount of help seeking. There's, there are behaviors, there are um, things that parents do to flag things for pediatricians and other professionals um, that will help speed that process along. We've all heard stories from parents about parents who raised concerns to the pediatrician and the pediatrician said, what? Wait. Wait, right? Give it six months, come back, we'll see how it's going. How it's going. Uh, hopefully we have fewer and fewer pediatricians saying that these days as a result of efforts of many of you. But there's another story uh, that I've heard in my office, and that's the story of the child who has a little bit milder presentation, and the parent didn't realize that until the child entered public school. It wasn't until they started getting around age normative peers that they realized that those behaviors were normal. And I think that's a fairly large proportion of parents, and even parents that do have developmental concerns, they may not be that confident about it, um, or the parents may not agree about that, and so the help-seeking behavior, the flagging that for a professional doesn't happen. And I think it's a really an overlooked part of what we do in terms of, um, uh, in terms of public parents. Also, uh, family relationships, like the co-quality of the co-parenting relationship. Collaboration and coordination between parents as they carry out their tasks for the, on behalf of the child. And parent adjustment, things like um, you know, health, satisfaction, um, sense of purpose versus depression, stress, things like that. But that can affect how uh, parental consistency, and those of us who work with individuals with autism, we know how important structure and consistency and predictability can be, right? But it also affects attunement and warmth. When your child is nonverbal, there's that much more call for an attuned parent be able to pick up on behaviors um, it, it sort of track situations over time and, um, and to, to see those behaviors as communicative. And then uh, treatment attitude, parental treatment attitudes and working alliance are things that um, affect whether parents even begin treatment at all, whether they engage in ABA or they go to see the psychiatrist um, and uh, whether once they've started treatment whether they adhere to that treatment. And so I'm going to talk about some findings from my own research related to these three areas. Um, for this setting, you know, it's, it's, I know that we have a diverse group here today. I'm glad that we have people from the community, practitioners and a variety of people. So, I'm presenting the research itself in sort of very broad strokes and then talking about the findings a little bit more. But um, if you're interested in more specifics, please stay for the discussion afterwards and we can, um, and we can talk more specifics. Or you can always send me an email and I can send you the paper. hands if you're familiar, if you've seen either of these signs, or you can identify where these come from. Most people. I guess this one does say autism. <laughs> so there are some major national and international uh, public awareness campaigns around autism, right? The CDC has put lots of money into 
the no, this, the After Early campaign. We have uh, one of their grants in South Carolina. I think you may have one here too. An After Early team and that works with uh, pediatric practices and things like that. And then Autism Speaks has done some wonderful videos, commercials. We all have seen the billboards. Uh, so there's a lot of resources put into this. But um, uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I started looking for articles that talked about just awareness of autism, knowledge of autism among the general public, and I couldn't find anything. Uh, they may be out there, but we really searched and I couldn't find anything. So how do we know how to target this information? Who do we target it to? Um, advertisers spend a whole lot of time and money figuring out how to target their advertising. <laughs> But we're pouring millions and millions and millions of dollars, and I don't know if we really know. Um, and so uh, I paired up with some uh, people at our university in communication, and we uh, wanted to look at this question of, um, first of all, you know, what were the predictors of awareness of autism? And we looked at the group that we thought would have the most, uh, would be in the best position to make a difference on this earlier identification, and that was parents of young children parents of children, two or younger, um, who did not have a child with autism. And so we wanted to know whether, you know, the awareness uh, changed as a function of age, uh, how long you've been a parent, uh, race, education, status, um, and then personal involvement with the issue of ASD, and whether that contributed to ASD awareness among parents in general. So this was an online survey. Has anybody heard of Amazon MTurk? So um, in this study, we had, uh, once we put the study out there, and uh, we had 687 completed surveys in 12 hours. So if you're interested, in, I can talk to you more about this process. Uh, we, uh, we haven't got a paper published on this yet, so you know, don't let me talk too soon. <laughs> but um, it was a immediate gratification for for the researcher. Um, and we have parents all over the country that responded to this. We measured awareness using an 18 item instrument uh, with was basically a list of symptoms and, and non-symptoms and people had to endorse the degree to which they believe that was or was not a symptom of autism. And then uh, involvement is defined as the degree of personal connection or attachment to the issue. So um, I do not have a child with, th these parents did not have a child with autism but it referred to you know how much they sort of felt personally connected to the issue outside of that. Okay, and what we found was that um, higher levels of education predicted a greater awareness, that um, closer involvement, sense of connection to the issue predicted greater knowledge of autism, um, and that uh, parents who identified as Asian or that, that was associated with lower awareness, significantly lower awareness. Uh, we didn't find any other differences by race, by racial groups. Um, length of parenthood were not significant. So hopefully you're thinking, why? I wonder what this means. What are we going to do about this? You know, we'll talk. We'll talk. Okay. Um, but I will, I will say, my hope for this work and the reason that we applied for the grant and did the study was because we were hoping that it would help us to target the, both the mechanisms of uh, kind of information sharing and the groups to which th things were targeted. Look for example, the billboards. Has everybody seen a billboard? Um, maybe even if you're not sort of a data person, do you know how many people what the average, you know, how many people have autism now? You know the one in? Okay, so, and, and have you seen that on a billboard? Because I see this on billboards all the time. Why is that the piece of information to put on a billboard? What, what does it prompt people to do? What, at, what are we hoping, what message does that send to people? I'd love a guess, you know, a couple guesses. If you were putting, you know, let's say you had a thousand dollars, you're going to put it in a billboard, you're going to put a message up. What does the one in eighty-eight prompt people for? Behavior. Want to get more information. What's that? You want to go out and find more information because that eighty-eight number is very low, mm -hmm. and the chances of your child maybe having it is enough that you go seek more information. 
Okay, so it, it makes you realize, well, this is a bigger problem than I thought. This is a bigger problem. So because it's a bigger problem, that might motivate me personally to take action. Yeah. And I think that's, any other suggestions about that? Why that would be a good idea to put up on a board? Yeah, I think that's a, good, that's a good suggestion, too. I think there's also probably something about funding and, and money that helps with that issue, too. The cynical part of me. But um, why not put other things up on a billboard? Why not put signs and symptoms, specific signs and symptoms up on a billboard? You know? Anyways, it, just, it, it gets me thinking. Okay, so um, this next study is a survey of 274 parents, and we were looking at treatment adherence. And uh, there's very little work that, that's been done on parental adherence to ASD treatments. Um, and we wanted to look at, because my, my, my um, co-investigator is a clinical psychologist at Greenville Hospital System, and she's day in, day out uh, working with parents and you know, seeing the joys and frustrations um, from, a, from a clinical perspective. Um, and so we know that parents of children with autism receive a ridiculous amount of treatments. I mean, do, do people know how many? I think there was a study that, you know, any point in time that people are involved in like seven different treatments. Um, and uh, that uh, some parents have reported up to 15 to 20 hours a week devoted not to treatment but to treatment navigation. I mean sort of managing all of the things they need to manage between the schools, the, the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the occupational therapist, and so on and so forth. And so it's a big deal. And adherence, you know, obviously makes a big difference on outcome. If people don't follow through with your behavioral protocol, for example, um, they can inadvertently put the child on a variable reinforcement schedule to reinforce the undesired behavior. <laughs> and uh, once you put a child on that schedule, for, you know, that, makes, that can make the behavior more entrenched than when you began. Am I right, my behaviorists in here? <laughs> and so it, it, you know, it's an important issue. We could make things worse is, I guess, one possibility. So we wanted to look at treatment adherence across a few different types of treatments. And we wanted to see whether there were differences, you know, whether parent demographics or co-parenting quality, treatment attitudes, or uh, child severity would impact adherence. Any guesses? What, what do you think would impact adherence if you were going to do this study? Maybe the number of children in the family. Okay. Yep, just needing the resources and being able to get the time off and driving and, okay. Any other, well, it, I'll hold off there. It's pretty warm in here, right? <laughs> Are people warm? I don't know if we have any control over the temperature. We open doors. We open doors, okay, all right. Well, that's okay. Well, we can accept that if there's no options, but now I've mentioned it. <laughs> Okay, and these were um, male and online questionnaires, uh, an identical version. Parents had a choice about how they wanted to fill it out. We had mostly mothers, but we had some fathers and other close relatives and uh, racial breakdown. The outcomes we were interested in is we used the same adherence measure, as the, the general adherence measure from the medical outcome study and we, so we asked the identical five questions for each treatment, for each of four treatment types. And we spent weeks figuring out how to cluster and classify these treatment types. Um, and there are a number of ways to do this, but we, we settled on medication treatments. So parents would report their adherence to each of these. Medication, behavioral, 
developmental treatments, and alternative treatments. And developmental treatments included speech and occupational therapy. That was mostly what that was. And then the predictors we looked at were education, relationship status, employment status, co-parenting quality. Um, again, if you know if, if if you don't if the adults involved with the child aren't on the same page about what's happening, we thought that would impact their ability to follow through. Um, parents' attitudes about treatment. If I don't think this treatment really works that well, I'm not going to put my I'm not going to you know devote all my resources to it. Or, um, or if I perceive the treatment as just being too burdensome. It's just too much. And then also, you know, the severity of the child's symptoms. Okay, so what we found was that, um, first of all, parents, this is self-report, so parents self-reported the highest level of adherence to medications, to medication treatments. Does that surprise anyone? Some people are shaking their heads. Why not? Why doesn't that surprise you? It's easier to do what you have with a prescription. It's easier to take, a, to take the medication. Yeah. Anybody have an alternative view on that? I think that sort of in the way we're socialized around medicine that the medication takes its toll is viewed as worse or more important to take every dose versus, well, if you miss a speech therapy session or whatever, we'll go next week. Okay. I think there's an attitude to Okay. That's different. When you started talking, I thought you were going to say it's sort of more culturally accepted and medical sort of treatments have more sort of authority, but mm -hmm. the idea that the risks would be greater with non with non-adherence, I didn't, I hadn't thought about that before. Co-parenting was associated with adherence to all treatments. So the greater I reported my co-parenting relationship, the more likely, the, the higher I also rated my <coughs> adherence to all treatments. That um, perceived family burden of treatment was associated with adherence to medication, developmental, and alternative treatments, but not behavioral treatments. Don't understand that at all. I still don't understand that. Perceived family burden question was, you know, this treatment is, has been burdensome on my family's time, resources, etc. I would have thought behavioral treatment would have been, um, but, you know, in this study that wasn't associated. And then being a single parent was associated with lower adherence to medication treatment only, which also is a little confusing to me. Um, in terms of the, the medication down greatly when you get as you, as you get to older older teens or adults um, who pretty much have more control over their lives for people that say they're not taking medication they don't need it they don't want it um, it's just a fun thing for them mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the the third point in terms of perceived burden of treatment versus behavioral I wonder whether the parents really understand or look at behavioral in a separate way I think that they they probably perceive behavior as part of medication developmental and alternative uh, in terms of the treatment or in terms of everything. I don't think that they will look at that as a separate issue. Just based upon my experience with parents and what I mm -hmm. talk to them when they, after they finish the program and they talk to me about issues that come up, it comes across as a total sort of just enveloped uh, perception of everything that's happening at once. Is that a that's something that we control for that. And so what we tried to do, and if you look at the survey, let's say behavioral treatments, and then it has a series of check boxes with, e with example descriptions that we thought would, be, would help parents best discriminate between them. But that's certainly a limitation of this study that you know, parents may not have, what they thought was a behavioral treatment may not have been what we thought was a behavioral treatment, and, and you know, it's also true for the others. And then finally, greater, uh, Child ASD severity was associated with lower adherence to behavioral and alternative treatments. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. In terms of being a single parent, um, having had, I had two sons on the autism spectrum, and one of them has been on a few complicated uh, red medication regimens. Mm -hmm. And I would think, I'm not a single parent, but I would think 
that just keeping up with getting the medication straight, it's been very, very difficult. First of all, to take stimulant medication. Um, it's gotten better now, but it used to be you'd have to get a new prescription every month. Now you can get a couple at a time. You can issue on Medicaid. You can only get them filled within a, a very short window, so you have to be almost out of them. Some uh, pharmacies locally will fill some prescriptions, and they don't like to fill a prescription uh, if it's a high dosage because they somehow think they have the right to uh, overrule a psychiatrist. It, it's been really, really difficult, and my son doesn't take medications that are that unusual. If I were a single parent working full time, I don't even want to think how difficult it would be. I thought about cost. And I thought there might be some overlap, say some confounding also with, well with family income. Insurances. But you, you know, your point about just the, the, the amount of time it takes to go pick up those prescriptions. I have a prescription, and I, d darned if I get that prescription on time, or I don't have some lapse or something, because I just can't quite find the time to drive down to the doctor's office, pick up the prescription, and, you know, and, and go do that. So yeah, I certainly understand that. But I hadn't thought about that before, just yeah, time. Cost is, is that, that I thought about time with the others, but I didn't think about it here, yeah. Thank you. I've heard some of those other treatment home models that delivered during the town school day as well, so that parent transportation issues and all of that is less tied up with some of those treatments mm -hmm. than treatments that are delivered primarily by the parent at Okay. Home. Um, it seemed that most of our kids get their OT and their speech therapy at school. Mm -hmm. so when the parent gets the child to school, they got the therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I wonder how that affected these questions, because parents are asked to self-report, you know, how much I adhere to recommendations from providers, but I wonder how much that influence the way, because they might have said, yeah, I'm doing good there, because I don't have to do Because <laughs> I send them to school. That's right. Their yeah, I'm getting them, getting them to school. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. These are good considerations. Okay, so I mean, I think an overall picture I is that, you know, I, I, I consider these results to be sort of preliminary, and I'd like to do some follow-up work with, um, you know, better tracking and, and some more in-depth measures. But um, I think uh, an overall picture, the overall message I'd like to communicate is that adherence, even within a family, may differ depending on the type of treatment we're talking about. I may be really good at following through with this treatment, I may not be so good at this one. And that adherence to different types of treatment may have different predictors. There may be different things that contribute to that, that we need to take into account. For example, my adherence to a medication to take whether I take a medication or not may um, par be partially due to th my distance to a pharmacy or distance to my physician. It may have to do with some attitudes I hold about medication and how that goes against my sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. Is anybody sort of exposed to that? It's something I'm very familiar with as a, you know, as a clinician. That, um, and, uh, and it'll differ, you know, it may differ between families. I think that's something that for those of us who are service providers, we need to keep in mind and begin to find ways to address or sort of understand better about these families. Okay. Um, the last study I'm going to talk about real briefly is this evaluation of a statewide behavioral intervention program. In South Carolina, we have a Medicaid-funded um, uh, pervasive developmental disorder program that, um, I'll, I have that on a slide in just a minute. So the objectives of this study were to examine factors that interfere with families' ability to use the PDD program treatment hours allotted to their child, and to elicit parent perspectives on factors that would make it easier for families to utilize treatment, and look at their level of knowledge about the PDD program. I'm going to focus on this one here just for the sake of time. So in South Carolina, this program provides ABA uh, therapy to children ages 3 to 11 for up to three years, for up to um, 40 hours a week. The wait list, don't get me started. <laughs> Um, and um, I, I am the evaluator for this program in our state. And so 
a big part of what I've done has been looking at these you know, outcome measures over time. You know, they have three time points, and they've been collecting data since 2007 on children. So we have um, you know, a data set of 664 children that we're looking at outcomes you know, in response to this treatment. But this is Sir Parent's report of you know, what they thought. So the director of policy at our developmental disability division had um, said to me in a meeting, we cannot understand this. We give them, we allot 32 hours a week to most of these parents. That's the typical allotment. <coughs> and many parents are only, many families are only using 11 hours. <coughs> Why are they wasting so much? You know, they could be, do, you know, using this so much more. We need to get to the bottom of this. Um, and so, you know, so that was part of why we were asking these questions. And so, you know, parents were able to identify what we took, what, what we thought were some common complaints, what we'd heard, and we had some parents sort of advise us on this um, who had been in the program. And so here's a list of um, possible barriers to parents obtaining treatment hours. This is just, you know, we're not, we're not going any more depth into what they were doing with those hours, but just having the provider come to their home for the hours. I know these are too small to read, so I'll read them for you. The upper bar here is 70, by the way. I tried really hard to get it to be 100, and I, you know, it, 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 it beat me. Um, provider times were inconvenient, 50%, a little over 50%. Provider did not offer enough hours overall. Other child treatment demands. ABA is not the only thing going on in my child's life. Parent work schedule. I have a laser. I could use my when laser. When you say other child treatment demands, that's not the other child in the family. That's other treatment demands for that child. That's right. Thank right. you for clarifying. It's other demands for, for that particular child. So other child treatment demands. Parent work schedule, up to 40%, a little over 40%. Location of services. Uh, my, many parts of South Carolina are very rural, and we struggle with um, how to provide services there. Family disagreements was pretty low. Uh, child school schedule was one of the biggest. Did that surprise anyone? Uh, so you'll see in the comments in just a minute, uh, one of the biggest comments that, people, that parents reported was, you don't provide services in the schools. If you provided these services in the school, during the school day, this would be you know, an easier, much easier for us. P so please do that. <laughs> and, we you know, and I told them, I told the administrators that, and they said, thank you for telling us that. <laughs> Additional caregiver demands, 50%. Probably things like, um, you know, making meals or, you know, taking care of aging parents of their own and, you know, who knows what else. Uh, or another child. Uh, and then the child is overburdened was the highest one. So, I don't know if this surprises people, but my, so it's the parent's perception that it's too much for that child was the most endorsed item for why I'm not getting, completing these hours. It's just too much. Now whether it is too much or not is another story, but that's the parent's perception. That's what's important to remember. So there's some a attitudinal piece to that that's influencing or is a barrier to obtaining treatment hours through this state-funded, you know, no cost to parents, ABA treatment. So, um, so that's you know just a couple examples of some ways that that I'm thinking about uh, the way that characteristics of the family, beliefs, attitudes, um, preferences, relationships, influence may influence outcomes, may either um, uh, kind of mitigate the effectiveness of of what we do, of what you know providers are doing. Um, there are, I'm sure there are lots more. I'm sure you can think of lots more. Um, 
But hopefully this is enough to get us talking today, get us thinking. I want to overlay this with, um, with family -centered, some family-centered care principles. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with family-centered care. I became intimately familiar with family-centered care two summers ago when um, I was, a, was hired as a strategic planner for the state of South Carolina. We got a grant through, um, through SAMHSA, which is a federal agency focusing on substance abuse and mental health, uh, to do planning for a, system, a statewide system of care. And so we brought together all these agency staff and parents advocates and, you know, and we had work groups. We had seven different work groups. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was an exciting time, an exciting summer with lots of strategic planning, lots of time sitting in a room like this, um, sticking notes to the walls and, you know, work. Um, and, uh, you know, all that to say that this notion of family-centered care is, is, a, is something that's pervasive across uh, child and family treatment settings basically all of them. Whether you're talking about juvenile justice, you're talking about mental health, um, uh, you know, DSS, this family-centered, these principles are, are critical. Medical home models, pediatrics. Um, but there are lots of lists of family-centered care values and principles. So I chose the shortest one. <laughs> and this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Okay, and you can see what those principles are. Uh, can, can people read that or is that still too small? Okay. So after you read those, the, the point I'd like to draw out is that um, if we are able to develop collaborative working relationships with families where they feel like we're on their side, and when I say we, I guess I'm talking to service providers now, where we're on their side and where uh, they believe that we have their best interests at heart and they believe that we care about what they say and we consider them an, an equal partner in treatment, outcomes will be better. And so we need to, I think as service providers in particular, but also as researchers, sort of diligently um, and relentlessly seek to develop these collaborative partnerships with families. Um, I think, you know, it's easy, people give lip service to that, but when you actually, if you actually tape them in their rooms and their sessions during their parent interviews or during their feedback sessions or their, your ABA planning sessions, we don't, we misunderstand this a whole lot. Um, and so the other thing I think we need to do is, is to kind of diligently hold a more complex view of families than, we, than, we may, than what's comfortable for us. And we have to be able to see, you know, just all those arrows flying around all the time and how things are related. And if we can keep that viewpoint, we, can, we start to see more options for intervention and treatment and change. Um, there is a systems concept called um, equifinality. Anybody heard that phrase? It's basically the idea that we can start in a lot of different places and get to the same outcome. Um, because a system is interrelated, the parts are all sort of affecting each other. We can start in different places. We can start where the family wants to start in some cases, in most cases, and we can get to, it's possible to get to the same outcome. And um, the beauty of uh, Nysonger is that um, you have all these pieces together in one place. So you've got the diagnostic facilities, the, you know, the assessment clinics. Uh, you've got the school that's educating the children. You know, you've got child uh, behavioral support services, these uh, beautiful people going out into people's homes and you know, trying to solve problems. Um, and you know the sibling, the emphasis on siblings and adult siblings and adolescents through these book clubs and um, and then adult behavior support services. It really runs the gambit in a way that is unusual. And um, 
I think maybe allows you to address some of these research questions and service questions in a unique way if we start thinking more integratively. Um, for example, I think um, our uh, behavior analysts and our family, family theorists, uh, family therapists, could really be a powerful combination in kind of developing some integrative models around how, which particular kinds of family support would help reinforce the outcomes of a behavioral intervention. So we can't do everything under the sun. So what are the essential ingredients? What needs to happen at a minimum? Maybe it's something around self-efficacy. Maybe for some families it's around education. Maybe there's some certain particular values that need to be in place or a particular relational context that needs to be in, in place before that behavioral intervention can be carried out. We just don't know. We just haven't really studied that very much. Um, but I think we can. I think you know, this is a good time. And I think this is a good place for that. OK, so we're doing pretty good on time. And I'm just going so to throw out a few examples of what I'm talking about. And then we'll have you know, 20 or 30 minutes for discussion, for those of you who want to. OK, so um, there are a few implications for engaging families. Uh, and here we're talking about professional behaviors. I'm going to talk about um, professional behaviors and then some structural supports. So first, regardless of the setting in which we're engaging families, whether we're, it's the very first assessment session or we're looking at for a diagnosis or we're you know, going to conduct an assessment or planning an assessment, it's important that we elicit family members' <coughs> expectations, that we don't assume that they want to accomplish the same thing that we think they want to accomplish. Families' reasons for getting a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder differ greatly. Is that true? Uh, some reasons have to do with eligibility criteria. Um, and services, they, they just can't get the services without this code. And those parents will push you. What do you mean my child doesn't have autism? He, he does have autism. I need that child to have autism. Um, dealt with that. Um, so we need to, to find ways to elicit these expectations from, from family members. So, you know, uh, what do you hope to get out of this? If, if you receive this information from me in a month or two weeks from now, what do you plan to do with that? What do you hope to have happen? How will this change things for you or your, or your child? Just a couple simple questions. But it, it may help you deliver the information and, and frame the assessment and frame the experience in a way that makes better sense to the family and gets buy-in easier. Uh, and then defining family. Uh, so <laughs> it's important that we make sure that the people that need to hear what you're going to say, hear what you're going to say. Um, thinking, uh, so you may need to reschedule something even to make sure that the person who really needs to hear you uh, hears you. Because um, let me just guarantee you that the message that gets communicated, like I was just talking about a, you know, two parents, or, so if I go to the doctor and the doctor tells me a message about what the diagnosis is and what the treatment is and you know, some concerns, and then I get home and my wife asks me, what did the doctor say? What I say to her is going to be very different than what the doctor said to me. <laughs> I mean, chances are. And that's certainly true for most of the many of the families that we work with. So making sure that the people that are important in the child's life are there and they hear what you have to say. Grandparents, best friends, in some cases, uh, certainly other parents, older siblings. Eliciting treatment attitudes, um, including treatment effectiveness. Uh, so, you know, uh, um, now I know that this would be a lot for anyone to add into their lives. How are you doing with all of this? Are there challenges that you and your family are facing that we haven't talked about yet? This is sort of during treatment or maybe the first few weeks of a behavioral intervention, for example. 
Parents may not just offer that up, but you know, it's important that we ask. What's your, sense of things, what's your sense of how things are going so far? Are things changing for the better? Is this going the way you'd hoped it's going? You'd hoped it was going to go? Um, and then this last point is regularly seek feedback from family members. So we've got a lot of data from mental health intervention research that suggests that the mere act of soliciting feedback has an effect size on outcomes that exceeds that of differential treatments. So in terms of the effect on, the, the effect on ultimate outcomes in child mental health treatment, um, or mental health treatment in general, whether you did CBT, psychodynamic, EMDR, or, you know, a range of other things, the differences between those approaches is less than the effect of at simply asking for feedback or not. So let me assure you that just even if you don't get the information you're looking for, the fact that you're asking has power. It shows care and concern and an attempt to understand that family's worldview. And then structural implications. So um, I guess I put this in two places. Um, and I, you know, I think a lot that there may be situations where we need to augment child treatments with brief family interventions, targeting things like beliefs or you know, conflict resolution or uh, psychoeducation or you know, whatever we need to do to make sure that that family is in a position where they can implement whatever it is that we're trying to ask them to, to do. Um, uh, Group-based parent interventions are really powerful. We all experience that, with, whether you're a parent or someone who's uh, talked to parents. The normalizing effect that that has uh, really helps to um, to help families move forward and understand what, where, they're, where they're heading. And then I think um, one of my interests is mobilizing these parent-to-parent -parent support networks. Uh, I don't know what the parent-to-parent -parent organization in your state is called. In my state, it's called Family Foundations. I'm sorry, it's called Family Connections. And we've, we've uh, implemented, we've submitted several grants together to look at using parent mentors to implement evidence-based interventions. Um, and I, I, I'm really excited about that possibility because, I, in my mind, that's a cost-effective way to deliver some brief interventions. And many parent mentors that I talk to would like to have a little guidance. They'd like to have just a little structure to their phone calls with those new parents. Okay, and then in terms of service systems, last but not least, um, Patient navigation models. This is something that we're talking about at, uh, in autism service centers across the country, but we haven't really done a great, uh, sort of a careful look at patient navigation models. I think that shows a lot of promise, um, particularly from, you know, from a social work perspective, this idea of uh, finding systematic ways to coordinate care um, and, um, and sort of provide services to wrap around the family. It could has a lot of potential, and and I I, th I wonder if it has the potential to get some funding through um, through the healthcare act and things like that. All right, and the rest of this I think is probably um, is probably going to make sense at this point. <coughs> oh no, I have another slide. Okay. I can skip that. That's where I'm going with my research. Um, I think, uh, you know, this idea of more integrative models of wrapping around the family, we sort of think about it, the family as, you know, we just need to get the family, we think about that more generally than we think about all of our other interventions. Um, and I think we need to change to start thinking about th that we can have greater precision in how we think about family support. And it requires, I think it requires that the psychologists and the, um, you know, the pediatricians and the social workers are sort of put their heads together and, and start thinking about how we can, um, how we can some develop some more um, precise models of care for parents. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.